Well, um, this, if we're going so long between uh, lectures, sometimes I think we may forget what it is we've been looking at, so I'm just going to do a, um, a quick review. Uh, this is part 12 of the uh, person and work of the Holy Spirit. I think we have perhaps um, two or three more studies after this to finish it off. Uh, as you know, we started by looking at uh, who the Spirit of God is. And we did see that, first of all, he, he is fully God, which means he has all the attributes uh, that the other persons of the Godhead have as well. Uh, we saw that he is personal, which means that he is not, as some believe, an impersonal force, um, just the power of God sent forth to do his will. Uh, and we saw that he is, in fact, a distinct person from the other two persons of the Godhead. So he's not just one, as it were, uh, mode, uh, one way in which uh, uh, the one, you know, uh, well, at least those who believe this, the one person of the Godhead reveals himself. Uh, there are three separate persons in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we saw that he is distinguished, um, not fully from the other persons, but each of the persons has something that uh, perhaps the Bible emphasizes a bit more than it does on the others as far as his particular nature. Uh, we, we did go in a little bit of detail as to uh, the Spirit of God being the love of God. Now, what we're doing is we're looking at how the fact that he is the, the love of God works itself out in his work. So we've seen that when the Spirit of God, uh, who is actually the one who applies uh, the work that uh, Jesus Christ has done, when he applies that work to an individual, when he applied it to us, he actually created a love for God in our souls. He created a love of holiness, things that have to do with the Lord. We call that uh, regeneration or the new birth. Uh, as he continues to work in us, he continues to cause that love to grow stronger and more comprehensive. Uh, we call that work sanctification. Uh, the Spirit of God gives to us a desire or a particular, let's say, love for a particular work uh, in which to serve the Lord. Uh, we would call that a calling, uh, not, not a factual calling, not the calling with which he actually calls us into the kingdom of heaven, but the Lord has actually placed on each of our lives a, a, a what we call vocation, something he wants us to do, something he's gifted us to do. The Spirit of God gives us a desire to do that. And, of course, um, we believe that he will always give us a desire to do something that is good. Um, he is the one who guides us as well by drawing our hearts out toward different things. And I'm talking here not just about life calling, but uh, even in particular decisions that we have to make. Sometimes the Spirit of God uh, gives us a desire to go one way or another. Uh, the Spirit of God gives us spiritual gifts uh, by which we can serve the Lord and, and show our love for him. And he also gives us gifts by which we can serve one another. And uh, those two are not mutually exclusive. I think last time we saw that um, he even gives us uh, natural gifts. The Spirit of God is the one who actually creates those things in different individuals, uh, whether they're Christians or not. If you have the skill to play music or if you're good at arts or you have the ability to work with metals or whatever it may be, uh, the Lord is the one who actually gives us that ability. He's also the one who allowed... Um, the great discoverers in history to make the discoveries they made. Uh, they didn't come up with those thoughts and ideas by themselves, but the Lord revealed it to them in his timing. So again, he gets all the glory for that. But the Spirit of God is the author of those gifts. Uh, when he strengthens our spiritual gifts, uh, the only thing he really has to do is strengthen our love, and that will strengthen everything that the Spirit of God does within us. It will strengthen the image of Christ in us, our desire to serve the Lord and also make our ability to serve him uh, more effective because we have more zeal. So we might say he empowers us by giving us a stronger love. And then we've also seen that the Spirit of God gives us a love for the truth, which is the reason why we pick up our Bibles and read them and why it is we want to take what we've learned and apply it to our lives. 
uh, because we have a love for those things. We want to do those things. We want to learn those things. Uh, so one, again, uh, this love the Spirit of God is, is something he creates in us that is really behind everything the Spirit of God does in our lives. And it, as I mentioned before, this is the one thing that separates a believer from an unbeliever. It is the only thing that separates a believer from an unbeliever as far as his person is the fact that he has the Spirit of God working this love in his heart. This is the reason why you and I trusted Jesus Christ when he was offered to us and why those who haven't trusted him don't trust him because they don't have that love. They don't have that taste or desire for spiritual things. So the Spirit of God works this love in us and this really from out, out from this flows everything that he does. Now, one thing we also saw, and I've been sort of repeating as a refrain throughout the study, is that love is very precious, that the Spirit of God gives to us, and we need to be careful that we uh, guard it, that we don't let anything quench it, uh, throw water on it, as it were. Uh, we need to remember that the Holy Spirit is, is not a substance. He's, well, I suppose he is. He's a divine substance, but he's not just a force or a power or some kind of quantity that, that God gives to us, but he is, in fact, a person, which means that he can be offended by different things that we do if, if we sin against him, and he can withdraw from us. And when he does, um, we are, our love for the Lord grows weaker, and we become less effective. Which is why uh, Paul writes, uh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve him. You can't grieve an impersonal force, but you can grieve a person. And the scripture says, when you grieve him, you do quench uh, the spirit. You quench his love. It's like pouring water on the spirit's influence. Uh, he withdraws somewhat. We lose something of our sense of God's love for us. And that joy that we would have in knowing him and the love uh, that we show to him. All of that grows weaker, and along with that, our assurance uh, and our ability to serve him. So instead of doing things that quench the Spirit's work, uh, we're called upon to do the things that actually strengthen his work within us. We're commanded to do this. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, be filled with his influence. Be under his control. The Bible says that uh, in, in certain circumstances, you know, certain individuals were filled with rage, filled with anger. And what that means is that they were under the control of this ungodly anger. When we're filled with the Spirit, it means to be under the control and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So instead of dishonoring him and sinning against him, instead we are to submit to him, uh, do the things that we know are pleasing to him, and we are to saturate our lives uh, with those um, different means that the Lord gives to us, the Spirit gives to us, uh, to gain more of his influence. In other words, the means of grace. Uh, Paul reminds us in Galatians 6, 8, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So basically he's telling us what it is we're going to be engaging in, what we're going to be immersing ourselves in, what we're going to be giving ourselves over to. If, if we're doing things to feed the flesh and we're sowing to the flesh, our flesh or our sin nature is going to get stronger. But if we do those things that encourage the Spirit's work and that honor Him, then that principle of the Spirit will grow stronger in our souls and we will be more like our Lord Jesus Christ. So anyway, that's just a summary of what we've been looking at. So what I want us to look at this evening is another work of the Holy Spirit that uh, has to do with one of the means of grace. And this, I think, is very applicable to what we're going to be doing in uh, about a half an hour when we conclude the study and go in the back to pray. The Spirit of God helps us to pray. So what I'd like to do is look at a couple of scriptures to begin with. So I'll uh, ask if anybody has a Bible who would like to volunteer to, uh, to read. 
Um, first, does anybody have a like to volunteer? Somebody's running for a Bible? Okay. Uh, uh, Kathy, would you uh, look up Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27? And then, Sarah, you've got uh, a Bible. Could you look up Jude chapter 1? It's only one chapter in Jude, verses uh, 20 and 21. And then I need one more volunteer to read. Okay, Dick. You would read Ephesians 6, verses 18 and 19. Now, the main thing we're going to be looking at is in Romans chapter 8. Those other two texts contain something in common that we need to look at uh, as well that I think will help us understand that uh, what we look at in <coughs> Romans chapter 8 is what we are, in fact, commanded to do. Okay, so first of all, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Now, I just want to make one, one note here, and that is the fact that Paul is telling us that the Spirit of God helps us to pray. And we're going to want to come back to that in just a few moments. But uh, let's look at the second passage, Jude 1, verses 20 and 21. The, the key words that I want you to see in this passage is praying in the Holy Spirit. That's something that uh, Jude is actually commanding his readers to do. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, and so forth. And then Ephesians 6, verses 18 and 19. Now, notice Paul here is commanding uh, the Ephesians to pray for all the saints and to pray for him, but to pray in a particular way. Uh, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. So what we want to look at is what it means to pray in the Spirit and what it means that the Spirit of God actually helps us to pray. Now, uh, I thought it might be helpful for us just uh, to review, first of all, what we already know about prayer uh, in order to define exactly how it is the Spirit of God helps us to pray. So first of all, let's, I, I could write this down on the board, but I'm not sure that's going to be uh, that important. Um, I think we're fairly familiar with this, but first of all, what is prayer? What are some of the things that we uh, know about what prayer is? Okay, it's essentially talking to God, isn't it? Uh, when Jesus was on earth, it was also talking with him, right? I mean, when, when Peter uh, was on the water and, you know, when Jesus was walking on the water, Peter said, you know, Lord, if that's you, then command me to come out. And he, he, he said, come. And Peter was walking on the water and he began to sink. And then uh, he, he cried, help, Lord, help. That was prayer as well. I mean, he was talking to Jesus, yes. No, no. The thing that makes it prayer is the fact he was talking to one who is God. Okay, so it is talking to God. Now, what are some of the things we talk to God about? What are some of the elements that make up prayer? Okay, petitions. We we ask God for certain things, right? What what else do we do when we're praying? Okay. All right. So we, we adore him. We praise him. Um, I, we can, you know, 
far as the way that uh, works out uh, kind of puts Thanksgiving after adoration. But I think we can, you know, when we're adoring the Lord, we can, you know, uh, not only praise Him but thank Him. Uh, certainly we need to confess our sins to Him. And we make supplication, which we've already heard. So prayer is talking to God and asking Him for things. I mean, when Peter talked to Jesus or cried out to Jesus, he had a request, Lord, help, you know, or save me. Uh, and sometimes we need to pray to the Lord in that way. But um, we don't necessarily have to think that every time we pray, we have to do all these things. But if we are going to sit down and spend some time with the Lord, it's not a bad idea to spend time worshiping Him. I mean, we, when we pray, we should thank Him. Uh, we certainly want you know, to worship Him in, in song. Uh, and again, thanking Him for all of His blessings uh, certainly... We want to ask the Lord's forgiveness for our sins. Uh, and we want to begin to ask him for things. Now, what is it that we are to be praying for, or how are we to pray? Okay, what has the Lord given to us as far as parameters to help us in our prayers? I mean, what, what are we supposed to be praying about? Uh, yeah. Okay, yes, we... We ask the Lord to fulfill his promises, and, and how do we know what the Lord has promised us? That's right, it's in, it's in the Bible. So we need to pray, perhaps maybe in a, you know, put this under a little larger rubric, uh, we need to pray according to God's will. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And the only way we can know what his will is, is um, if we read the Bible and find out, okay? Uh, what, what else is supposed to be true about our, our prayers? Yes? So are you arguing against uh, forms of prayer, like written prayers? Then? Okay, so we, we need to, yeah. But we don't want to just say the same thing and just go through a ritualistic list or this is what I normally say. Like we teach our, what we teach our children to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. You know. um, just a simple prayer, but actually it's meant to be a pattern, even as our Lord gives us the Lord's Prayer. Uh, he gives to us a, a pattern of prayer. And we may use those exact words if we want to, but I don't think he intends for us to make it a ritual. Uh, that's one of the things that, he, at least here personally, my conviction is that I've, I've heard it recited before, and I'm, I'm not going to you know, uh, necessarily say that that's wrong, but I just don't feel comfortable just reciting a prayer. I think we should apply it, and we should use it as a pattern. Um, so. No, but not just using the same words all the time, remembering that who it is we're speaking with. Yes? That's right. We need to pray in faith. Jesus tells us, whatever you ask in my name, believing, you will receive it. Okay? And of course, we need to know it's the Lord's will, so we need to look in his word. We need to, of course, address the Father. But it has to be in faith. What else has to be true about how we pray if we want to be heard? What's the motive behind our prayers? Okay, for God's glory. That's right. Everything we pray, we need to be praying for the glory of God. And that means even when we ask for things for ourselves, or ask for things for other people, though we may love ourselves and love other people and be concerned about both, we still need to pray that these things would be heard and answered so that God would be glorified. That's the reason why he made everything. It's the reason why he put us in the situation that we're in with the needs that we have so that when he meets those needs, he would receive the recognition and the credit and the honor for those things. Uh, by the way, along with uh, God's glory, there's another motive that needs to be there, which I think 
his glory or desire for his glory kind of grows out of that. Love, yes. Everything that we do, we need to do out of a love for God and we need to do with his glory in mind. And of course, if we love him, we'll want to do it for his glory and not our glory. Okay. Uh, what else needs to be true of our prayers? In whose name do we ask? In Jesus' name, that's right. And why do we need to ask in Jesus' name when we pray? So we have no right to approach the Lord, but we are authorized by Jesus and what he has done to come to the Father. So on the basis of his merits, we can ask for these things. We can't ask in our own name. We need to ask in the name of Jesus. Anything else that we can add to this? So one, one other thing as far as how we pray, and we're going to come back to this in a minute, is we need to pray in the Spirit. Okay. Now, let, let's ask one more question about prayer before we look at what it is the Spirit of God actually does, okay? Why is prayer important? Why did the Lord give us prayer? What's its purpose? Who knows, right? <laughs> we just pray. <laughs> well, think about why you, why you pray. Yes, we are commanded, that's right, it's obedience. So it is important that we do it for that reason. Is there any other reason? Okay. So it does show our dependence upon him. And that actually is wrapped up in, in you know, perhaps the, the thing that I'm looking for. Okay. He wants us to... Um, understand our dependence on him and so he gives us prayer as a means not only to you know, express that dependence but to do what well to certainly to glorify him okay. that's right okay so prayer is, we might say, is, is the means by which, the means that God has given to us to actually get what it is he's promised us. I mean, we can't, I mean, if we don't, what, Jesus says, I don't see. It isn't Jesus, I think that's right. Um, no, it's James, okay. You have not because, you ask not, okay. And of course, you can ask and not receive it because, wrong motives, okay. So we have to have the right motives, the glory of God, and the love for him. But we do need to ask. And Jesus did say on another occasion, uh, you know, knock and it shall be open to you, seek and you shall find, ask and it shall be given to you. Okay? Uh, sometimes we don't get because we don't ask, but prayer is the means by which God has given to us to ask him for the things he's promised to give us. Okay, so that's why is prayer important? Because that is how we get what God has actually promised. That is how we advance the kingdom of heaven. That is how we, we get the Lord's help for other people. That's how we get the Lord's help for ourselves. So, uh, I mean, if, if Peter hadn't um, cried out to the Lord, I, I, I imagine that Jesus would have saved him, but uh, maybe he would have waited a little bit longer before he did because there was something he wanted to teach Peter. And that is, Peter, you need me. And so I want you to look to me and cry out to me and ask me, and I'll be there to provide that. Okay, so that gives us an idea of what, what we're looking at when we're talking about prayer. We're talking to God and, again, the different elements of prayer, praising or adoration, confession, asking. We are to pray according to his will and faith with his glory in view out of love for him in the name of Jesus in the spirit. And it's important because it's the means by which the Lord has given us. Uh, to get things from the Lord, things that we need, things that he wants us to pray for to advance his kingdom. Now, think about this just for a minute. Does God have a desire to advance his kingdom? Okay. And if none of his people pray, is his kingdom going to advance? 
Likely not, right? I mean, except if and none of his people are praying, the Lord's going to perhaps do something to get them to pray, right? But he, he wants us to pray because he has made us one of the means by which his kingdom expands. Uh, so, yes, the Lord wants us to pray. He's, you know, the, we really can't not pray. And who was it that was saying recently, I think maybe it was the Miles, maybe it was Keith Miles, what he said I think was true that most of the work of advancing the kingdom is done in prayer. If you've really sought the Lord for something, then when you actually go to do that thing, it's, it's you know, the Lord is going to be with you. He's going to work it out. He's going to help you. But if you don't spend that time in prayer, you're pretty much going out in your own strength and you're not going to accomplish anything. All right, well, now let's get back then to, oh, yes, Kathy? I think that's where confession comes in, yes, okay. But that's, that's a good thing to, uh, to know. All right, now, considering all we know about prayer, you know, as far as what we're to pray for and how we pray and so forth, uh, what does the Spirit of God actually do to help us? And what does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Can you think, going back to, um, well, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to turn up Romans chapter 8. If you have a Bible, you can do that. It might be a little bit easier to follow. Sure. As far as confession, you mean, as opposed to something else? Yes, it, it is con confessing to a priest or something, or no, 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 no. It is, it is confessing our sins to the Lord. Sure. Um, when we confess, when we confess our sins, we're basically repenting of all the wrong things we've done. As we approach the Lord, uh, well, the Bible tells us that that if if we are true believers, if if we're trusting, well, let me just read this passage. This will probably sum it up. Well, we're talking about um, we're talking about private, but it can be public too. But if it's public, it should be more general uh, and not so specific. You know, in other words, we don't have to enumerate all of our sins in public to the Lord. Yeah, that could be rather embarrassing <laughs> and, and humbling. Right. Unless, of course, we've sinned against someone, then we need to go ask their forgiveness as well. But you're right. If we're going to confess our sins, particularly, we... Yeah. We... Right. Yes, he does. But, but the scriptures say this in 1 John 1. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We say that we have not sinned. We make him a liar and his word is not in us. So even though he knows, uh, it, is, it is the nature of a Christian to confess his or her sins to the Lord. And that would be in your private prayers. But you'll, you'll notice when we get back in a few moments for public prayer, uh, we might, somebody might say, I might say, Lord, forgive us our sins. And that's general, okay, but not specific. So we do admit we're sinners. We do need the Lord's forgiveness. We're asking for his forgiveness, but we're not enumerating all the sins we're guilty of. Right. 
is. That is important. Um, doesn't mean we can't pray before we do that, but we ought to make our prayers, that should be the bulk of our prayers, if we haven't done everything we can do to be reconciled to that person. All right, well, let's get back now to what the Spirit of God does. I mean, what does it mean to, um, that He helps us? What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Let me just read uh, Romans 8, verses 26 and 27 again. And in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, I do believe that uh, what Paul is referring to here is the same thing that we saw in Jude and also in Ephesians. Now, Jude said it on one occasion. Paul said it in Ephesians. We need to pray in the Spirit. I think this is praying in the Spirit. So this is what we're going to focus on here. What does it mean that the Spirit of God helps us? We're weak. We don't know how to pray as we should, um, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. What, what can that mean? What are some of the possibilities? Okay, that he, is, that he is praying, that is certainly true. Uh, now, he is helping our weakness, right? And we don't know how to pray as we should. So is, is the idea here that uh, since we don't know how to pray, the Spirit of God will just simply pray for us, and we don't have to pray, okay? I mean, we can all just sit around in a circle in the back, and we can all just say, I, I really don't know what to pray. <laughs> so the Spirit of God is going to be praying for us, and we'll just be quiet. All right, well, you know, I mean, he does intercede, but, but how does he intercede? It does talk here about groanings, too deep for words. Uh, is the Spirit of God groaning? Uh, this is one of the things we need to think about. But what are some of the ways the Spirit of God, though, getting away from the groanings just for a moment, um, how is it the Spirit of God might actually help us in our prayers? Um, Kathy? Okay, uh, that's one way this could be understood, is the fact that we, we really don't know, uh, you know, maybe specifically what we ought to pray in certain circumstances, or knowing the will of God, how we're going to apply that to a particular situation and pray so that God hears us, because we do need to pray according to the will of God, and maybe we don't know what the will of God is in that circumstance, so we need some help from the Spirit of God to take what we do know and pray for the things we can pray for. Does that make sense? In, in other words, he would lead us then, this would be like a teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit to help us apply the Word of God to a particular circumstance so that when we pray, we pray according to the will of God, and since we pray according to the will of God, then the Lord's going to hear us, right? Because if we, do, if we pray contrary to His will, He's not, He may hear us, but He's not going to answer us. Okay, Donna? Well, yeah, I mean, right, yeah, or, you know, what we should be praying for in that particular situation, which, which would be, I think, pretty much, again, the Lord showing us from the Word, you know, what it is that we ought to be looking for, what we ought to be seeking after in that prayer. I don't... Obviously, you know that from what we've seen before, we don't believe the Spirit of God is going to communicate supernatural knowledge to us, but he's, He can help us see things that are already there that we haven't seen, just as He helps us to see things in the Word of God that are already here that we haven't understood or known how to apply. Yeah, I think so. Um, It, it, it's quite possible that that's what the groanings you mean is <laughs> getting to, to the groanings, yes. Uh, possibly, I and mean, certainly uh, there's nothing that would keep the Spirit of God from doing that. Right? Um, praying, 
to the Lord, uh, even from our own souls, the things that really need to be done. That's certainly a possibility. Dick, you look like you want to come in. Well, it really depends on what this groaning really has to do with. Okay? And we'll, we'll, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll look at that in just a moment, but I wanted to look at um, what else the Spirit might actually do to help us pray, and I think it's tied into this. So in, in this case, what we're looking at is when it says here that the Spirit is helping our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we should, it's not so much the content of our prayers but the manner in which we pray. Because when you think about um, you know, uh, what kind of prayer, I mean, what, what kind of prayer is it that the Lord will actually hear? Okay, it needs to be sincere. Needs to be in faith. What's that? It, okay. It, it has to come from a heart purified by grace. That's right. The righteousness of Christ uh, imputed to us and so forth and in his name. Uh, I'm sorry, Gladys is... I think that's that would be that would be certainly part of it, you know, and that's an important part of it. The Spirit of God is moving us to, uh, well, to express or perhaps experience uh, the depths of certain things in a way that we wouldn't. Uh, what I was trying to get at in my questioning before is it goes along these lines. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, the, um, the Spirit of God, when, I'm at, when I was asking the question, what kind of prayer should we offer to the Lord? Okay, and we talked about prayer and faith, out of righteousness and so forth. If all that were done, but we were sitting there just kind of, um, Lord, would you please do this? Lord, would you please do that? And, you know, you're just sort of distracted and, and just very weak desire that something take place. You don't really, really want it, you know, it's not fervent. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, you know. Um, the Lord doesn't want us to, um, to be indifferent in our prayers. And what you were expressing was a depth of, 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 of expression over my sins. It should be deep, and we should as we're laying our cards on the table. But it should be that way in whatever we're asking. You know, if we're asking for something for God's glory, it shouldn't be something that doesn't, you know, just not matter to us. Okay, I think the Spirit of God works the kind of prayer that is honoring to the Lord. He works that kind of prayer. He works a kind of fervency or an ardency in it that makes us so love the Lord and desire to glorify Him that we ask with that kind of fervency. And sometimes it's a fervency that can't be expressed in, in words. In other words, it's sort of a depth of feeling. And, um, and as we think about this, we're, we can't help but examine our own hearts. Are we experiencing this kind of prayer or are we doing the other kind where we just sort of list things out without feeling it very strongly? But here I believe Paul is telling us that the Spirit of God is doing things. It says here that we're weak and we can't pray as we should. The Spirit of God is going to help us. And I think it's not only by helping us understand what to pray for, but also in the way that he helps us to pray as we should with the manner of our prayers, which is with the depth of, of emotion or of, of, of fervency or ardency or love and desire for God's glory. Now, that's where we get to the, uh, the groanings, I think. Okay, what do these groanings mean? It says here, we don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Is Paul telling us here that the Spirit of God inside of our souls is just going, you know, like this, to the Lord, just kind of groaning and moaning? Is that, is that what's happening here? You know, it's, it's a groaning that is too deep for words. In other words, the, 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 the sensation or the, uh, the emotion or the affection that's involved here is so deep that words really can't express it. And so is the Spirit of God just kind of moaning in our spirits. You know, if Greg were here, <laughs> one thing he <laughs> pointed out that Lloyd-Jones, as he's talking about this particular passage, says, the Spirit of God does not groan. You know, you just, you just lay that down. And I think that that's probably true. I'm not sure that the Spirit of God is necessarily groaning here, but I do think that he is causing, perhaps, a groaning that is coming through our souls. In other words, what he does in us is, um, is causing us to do something. His intercession is causing us to do something, causing us, as it were, to, to groan. Now, I'm not saying that we should all, you know, get in a circle, and I can't think of what I'm supposed to say, so, you know, I just start groaning and moaning and so forth, and the Lord's going to uh, see that, but I think there's going to be something of this ardency in our prayers. You know how it is uh, when you know, you're, you're sitting there and you're, you're thinking about all the different things you could pray in a particular cir circumstance, or maybe you're, you're grieved over your sins, and you're thinking about all that you've done, and, and the Lord, by His Spirit, is helping you to feel the depth of your sin, and you just, maybe you do begin to moan, you know, over the fact that you've dishonored the Lord. Can the Lord understand that? Can He interpret what you're saying? Well, he can, you see. So I think it's talking here about the Spirit of God helping us to pray at a certain kind of depth of affection that we would not be capable of doing without. I mean, we, we can't do anything spiritually pleasing to God apart from his Holy Spirit. But the Spirit of God is working this kind of grace in us, guiding us in our prayers, and interceding, as it were, through us, through our souls, giving us, again, this, this kind of ardency or fervency or love for what is right that may cause us to deeply repent of our sins or earnestly seek after something in a way that we just really can't find the words to express. I think that's probably the best way to understand this passage. 
And the thing is, the Father sees this, and he, he understands what the Spirit of God is actually moving us to, to feel or to say and so forth, and he knows what the Spirit is indicating. I mean, it says here, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. This is the Father searching our hearts as we're praying. He knows what it is the Spirit of God is interceding, what he's saying. Because he, that is the Spirit of God, intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I mean, he's, he's helping us again here to pray according to the will of God. What it is that, that we're actually expressing to the Lord in, in ways that we can't even find the words for is going to be according to the will of God. So basically, I think what we have here is, is this, and this is, this is interesting and encouraging. We have not only an intercessor in heaven, Lord Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of God, praying for us continually, uh, pleading his merits on our behalf, uh, keeping us in the grace of God through his intercession. But we have the Spirit of God on earth in our souls, helping us to pray according to the will of God in the way that we've just, uh, we've just seen. So we have two advocates that the Father has given to us to help us in our prayers. That should be encouraging, I think. You know, we're not on our own when we pray. Uh, we have help, uh, help even to help us pray the way we should pray in a way that God will actually hear and answer our prayers. And by the way, when we pray according to the will of God and in this way that desires his glory and out of love for him, and we come to him, you can't really do that without faith, and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, what's going to happen? He's going he's gonna to hear and he's going to answer it. Not necessarily in the way we think he's going to and not necessarily in our timetable, but if we have asked for something according to the will of God out of a desire for his glory, trusting Jesus Christ and his merits alone to even gain access to God, God has heard us and he's already answered us. And all we have to do is basically wait to see how that's going to work out. Does that mean we should just pray for it once and then let it go? No, we should continue to pray and, until we see it happening, but remember that God actually hears you the first time, and he does answer your prayers when you pray in this way. So uh, the Spirit of God, if we, if we tie this to his nature, the Spirit of God is love. He is the love of God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so forth. And he gives us that love for God and that desire for his glory that's necessary for the Lord to hear us. So that's the way he helps us, and that's the way, again, his particular nature works itself out in our souls. Um, the Spirit of God is the one who is ultimately going to bring us from where we start as sinners uh, all the way to heaven. And it all boils down to, again, love, that love he creates in our souls. Yes, uh, Sarah. Which motive is that? You mean glory, his glory? We always have to check ourselves because the Spirit of God is working in our souls. But there's another principle in our souls too, isn't there? And, and what is that? The flesh, which is corruption and sin. So when we're praying, when we're talking, when we're thinking, when we're desiring, when we're doing, everything that we do, we have to decide, is this coming from the flesh or is it coming from the Spirit? Is this something honoring to the Lord or dishonoring to the Lord? When we're praying, we can very easily lapse into, I want this because I want this. You know, I want this person to be healed because I love that person and I want them to feel better. I want the Lord to meet this need because I love myself, you know, and I want this need met. Um, those are the wrong motives when we're praying. Even, we can even pray that people be converted for the wrong motives because I love them so much I can't even you know, conceive of the idea of them suffering. But we need to go beyond that to the Lord's glory, yes. Well, it, we, we need to do both, of course, you know, not doubt that he heard us the first time, but when the Lord says that we should ask, it's the, the, the tense 
of, of the verb in the Greek has a, a continuing action to it. In other words, if he says, ask, keep on asking, seek, keep on seeking, knock, keep on knocking. Um, and there's also the parable that Jesus gave uh, of the uh, unrighteous uh, judge where the widow kept, or the woman, I think she might have been a widow, kept coming to him and he, he wouldn't answer her right away, but because of her persistency, he finally did. Although that was teaching us that if an unrighteous judge will, will do this, then won't God hear his people? But I, I think the idea, though, is that we are to pray and not grow weary. So I think there's a sense in which we believe that the Lord is hearing us, but until we, we see it, he wants us to continue to seek. For one thing, if we don't, we'll probably forget, unless it's really important, that we even asked him. <laughs> And so when it happens, and if you're like me, I'll probably forget. So when it happens, I'll say, oh, isn't that nice, you know, and forget that I've been praying and asking for that. So maybe it's the thing is just to remind us that we're seeking the Lord for it because uh, he remembers, but we don't. Did you have another question? Well, I think if, if let's say we're, we're in prayer and you just maybe said this prayer and, and you realize that, hey, I wasn't really thinking about God's glory and whether or not he gets honored through this and I'm you know, seeking that because I love him, I was really just seeking it for myself. I don't think you need to pray that prayer again with a new motive. I think you just need to repent of the wrong motive and then just renew the right motive in your heart. And I think the Lord will honor that. So we always need to be checking our motives and making sure. But we do have two principles in us. And we can operate through both. So that's why when we, when we see that we've been doing this for the wrong reasons, then we need to, in our hearts, repent. And perhaps you know, ask the Lord to forgive us. Uh, we do need to confess our sins, not necessarily particularly and verbally, but before the Lord as you're praying silently and ask the Lord to forgive you for that motive, but to hear you for the right motive. Does that make sense? You know, so you don't have to do it all over again. You just need to repent of that wrong motive and renew the right desire in your heart. don't see, see too many unconverted people walking around saying the same thing. It's, um, it is something the Spirit of God does, and yes, um, I think we all ought to be experiencing that uh, to one degree or another, because we're falling short. I mean, every moment we're falling short, so there isn't a moment in time when we're doing everything we should be doing. Loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, I mean, when have we ever done that, even for a moment in time? And if we haven't, then we've sinned. And so we need to be continually asking God for forgiveness. Now, we do need to, of course, guard the fact that um, if, if there are sins we commit, there are sins we commit all the time that we're not even really even co you know, conscious of. We don't have to uh, make sure we've, we've repented of those that we're unaware of and have confessed those in order to be forgiven. But the ones we are aware of, as the Lord brings them to our mind, we need to be confessing those and asking for forgiveness and asking, Lord, in all that I've done that I'm not even aware of, Forgive me. But that will be the, um, the heart of a, of a true believer will be asking God for his mercy, yes. Well, the, um, the verse that we read earlier, 
says that if we are confessing our sins continually, the Lord is continually cleansing us of all unrighteousness. So if the pattern of our lives is that we are confessing sins as the Lord reveals those sins to us, he, he cleanses us not only of, of those, but of all unrighteousness. Now, if there's some sin we're committing, we're saying, you know what, I'm not going to repent of that particular sin, then we really haven't repented of sin. We've, all, you know, we've given up those other things for some other reason. If we hate sin, we're going to hate sin across the board. We're going to repent of all of our sins. So anyway, but the idea is, you know, it doesn't have to, we don't, if we miss some, that doesn't mean we're going to miss heaven. If we're aware of them and we hold on to them, then that's a problem. We can't do that. We have to repent of all of our sins. Okay, but even if we don't do a full confession because we're not aware of everything, and our conf everything we do is going to be imperfect. The Lord is still going to perfectly cleanse us because of his mercy and grace. Uh, I'd ask for more comments and questions, but we're, we're going to actually end up having just about enough time to sit in a circle and moan and groan, uh, because we're not going to know what to say in the short amount of time we have. No, it, it's about five after. Are there any other questions um, or comments that we we can always bring it back next time if you want to and so forth? But uh, it was good good discussion, and when we get into a good topic, it does generate a lot of good discussion. So let's close with a word of prayer, and then we'll, let's just, if we can, go straight back. We've only about 25 minutes left, so if we can just go straight to the back and begin to worship and pray, that'll be, that'll be great. Okay, well, let, let's close this time in a word of prayer.